Okay, good evening. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Torah studies this week. Parshas Bechukesai. Uh, we are completing the book of Ayikra, the third book of the Torah. And the topic we're going to discuss today, you're feeling uninspired, right? Sometimes, great. Now is your chance. Discovering the spiritual opportunity of a human moment. So, this happens to everyone, I think. Unless tzaddikim present, company excluded, your old tzaddikim. But we know sometimes we have we are inspired when it comes to excited about doing it, wake up, waking up, we want to go to shul, we want to do a mitzvah, we want to do something good. And it works, uh, you know, we don't have to work hard for this. And sometimes it doesn't go that well. Sometimes we don't feel inspired. Sometimes we feel, you know, it's hard. And uh, and the reason why it's happening is uh, understood because, you know, we can, uh, we find ourselves busy running, taking the kids to school, running to work, busy all day long, headaches, coming back. And then you tell you, you know, you have to also sit down and go, go, go to a uh, Torah shir, go to shul and this and something you feel like it's, you know, it's another burden. It's another more items on the never ending checklist that you have to do. And uh, so what do you do? What do we do when, when you're not inspired? So some people say, okay, and the easy way out, okay, I'm not inspired. What's the point of going to shul? I might as well stay at home. I'm not gonna do it. And there's also rational rationalizing it, saying, you know, when you're if you're doing something, you're doing for God, you got to do it with feelings. If you do it just without feeling, what's the point? That's just like doing it mechanically. So some people can get to this conclusion. Other people say, no, I'm going to do it nevertheless. Yes, feeling, no feelings. Let's do it. You know, just like just like you don't have a choice waking up in the morning, whether you're not in the mood to go to work today, you have to go to work, whether you like it or not. If you want your job, you go to work. Here are certain also obligations that I have to God. So people say, let me do it anyway. So the question is, is there a third way forward? Is there another way forward to this dilemma? And that's what we're going to discuss and answer this question as we delve into the power show this week. So, as we said, it's a parsha this week, is Parsha's Bechukaisai. Parsha's Bechukaisai is the last week, the last portion of the book of Ayikra. And the custom is among Jews, that when we finish, we complete the whole book, the whole congregation proclaims chazak, chazak, venit chazek. Be strong, be strong, and we will be strong. Where is this custom? Where does this custom come from? So the custom comes from actually from a, from a based on a verse in the, in the book of Yehoshua. Of Joshua. So let's see it inside. Just a minute, I'm getting there. Okay, so this is the topic we have.
Okay. So, so here, uh, so here is the, the the dilemma we have. What do we do when we are in this spiritual rut? What do we do? Not do what we don't feel like doing, or plug through and do what needs what needs to be done, regardless. So here is the verse in the book of Yeshua. It says, "Lo yamush sefer atera zem ipicha vagisa ba yimam v'layla chazak ve'ematz." This book of the Torah should never leave your mouth. You should meditate on it day and night. Be strong and have courage. So, what is this verse in the context? What is this talking about? You know, this is talking about. When Yeshua, when after Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, and Joshua was instructed by Hashem to be strong, to lead the people into Eretz Israel, and uh, and God told him to be strong, and to strengthen, and how to strengthen himself is through this Torah. When you study this Torah and you keep this keep this Torah, that will be your strength. Now, since the terrorist, this verse is talking about that you should not, it should not leave the part from your mouth. These words, continue studying in day and night. We've, and there's in the same verse, it talks about be strong and be strengthened. This is why when we conclude a book of the Torah, we pronounce this, we announce this and proclaim that be strong, be strong, and let us be strong. We are saying that we are going to be strong, strengthening each other to continue to study this Torah, that although we concluded the Torah, we take the strength and we, con- and we continue to study the Torah. And this will also be the strength that we gain the strength, we derive the strength from the Torah itself, we derive the strength. And that is why we announce this Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazik. As we continue to read there, and this comes from our Chashulchan, it says, the verse cautioning us that the Torah should never leave our mouth continues with be strong and have courage. This is the source of our custom to announce and at the conclusion of a book of Torah, that we to announce it, that be strong, be strong, and we will be strong. And the truth is, uh, just like there is in the, we have the strength we gain from the, the, the end of the, of the Torah, there's also a strength that we gain from the beginning of the Torah. And in fact, there is, um, there is a concept of con- taking the beginning and the end together. We take the beginning and the end and we see something that is in common. And when we see what is in common between the beginning of the book and the end of the book, that we take, we have the takeaway that teaches us what what is the message, what is the message, what we can uh, take from this. So, yeah, so this is Jewish tradition. This is the conclusion of the section of a Torah as, as especially meaningful. And so it is with the section that is the opening opening section. And this comes from the book from the Sefer Yetzirah, the Kabbalistic book, which is attributed to to Avraham Avinu. It says, notes Seifan B'Tchilasan, B'Tchilasan B'Seifan. The end is embedded in the beginning, and the beginning in the end. So now, what do we have to do? We have to analyze. So let's see what is written in 
the end of the verse of the book of Bamid of Aikra, and what is written in the beginning. So what is interesting in the end of the book, we have the parsha concludes, and the book concludes with two animal-related mitzvahs. We're going to take them one by one. The two animal-related mitzvahs, the first one is the mitzvah of Bechor, the mitzvah of the firstborn animal. It says like this, Ach Bechor lo yagdish ish No one may consecrate the firstborn of an animal since the firstborn already belongs to God, whether an ox or a sheep, and it belongs to God. So let's give a little background here. What is this mitzvah talking about? The mitzvah of the Bechor is that there is the gifts that God gave to the Kohens. So um, one of the things that was given to the Kohen is the Bechor. Any firstborn animal needs, goes to the Kohen. What does the Kohen do with this Bechor? So the Kohen gives it, uh, brings it to the Holy Temple. And in the Holy, tem- in th- the Holy Temple, they bring it as a sacrifice. And part of it goes to the altar. And part of this goes to the Kohen. The Kohen with his family can eat it, and they have to eat it in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And how, however, what happens if the animal is unfit to be offered on the altar, if it has a blemish, then that Bechor becomes the personal property of the Kohen. He can do with the animal whatever he wants. He can sell it. He can even sell it to a non Kohen. The only restriction is that he, can, he had a sell. The sale has to be conducted privately. It cannot be sold at a market. So, in light of this mitzvah, the verse that we just read explains that the firstborn animal cannot be dedicated as a donation to the temple. The owner of the animal cannot take this. Uh, firstborn and say, oh, this is my donation to the temple. You cannot do it because this Bechor, this firstborn already is dedicated to God, already belongs to the Kohen, so you cannot do this. That is one mitzvah. Then we have another mitzvah, the other mitzvah, the mitzvah of Masa Behema. What is Masa Behema? Masa Behema is the, the tenth the tithing of the animals, that every tenth animal has to be to, given to, um, to the, again, to the, to the temple. We'll soon uh, tell the details. What do, we, what do we see in there? The cholmasa bakabatsoin, every tithe of the, of the cattle or flock of all that, uh, that pass under the rod, we'll soon explain what that means. Every tenth animal will be holy to God. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitutions. If anyone does make substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commandments God gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the children of Israel, and that's how we conclude this book. What is this uh, mitzvah talking about? So this mitzvah, the mitzvah of the tithing, is talking about the Maisa Behemoth. You know, we have tithing, we have different types of tithing. Um, you know, do we have the most common thing that we know is we have to give uh, 10% of the produce that grows in Israel, you have to give 10% to the Levites, being that they are not, they don't have their own fields, that God did not give them, they do the service on behalf of the Jewish people, so they need to give them the 10%. And nowadays, the tithing, we don't have, we don't live in such a agricultural uh, society, so the tithing is a rabbinical mitzvah, that we give 
10% of our net income, we give it to either to the poor or to another holy charitable cause. So, and this is, by the way, one of the things that God says, he promises when you give the 10%, you will see the blessing. And uh, God says, this is one mitzvah that you can test me, you can try me, you'll see, you'll give the tithing, you'll give the 10% of your income, you'll see the bracha, the blessing that comes in your income. So, and he, but here what we're talking about is the specific mitzvah of the tithing of the animals. That means that you have, you have to give 10% of the newborn animals. You have to give the 10% to the to God. What do you do with this? You bring the animal to Jerusalem and you have to bring it offer to offer the, the animal there. And again, just like the firstborn is giving to the Kohen, this is giving to the owner, but he has to do it in Jerusalem with his family, with his friends, and then and, and they have to eat it in Jerusalem. Part of it goes to the altar and part they 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 use for the offering. Now when a person is a farmer, he has a lot of animals, he can be tempted to play some games. He's going to say, you know what, I'm going to pick the, I have to give 10% of all my uh, flock, let me pick the more skinny ones, the bad ones, I'm going to take them to Jerusalem. I don't want to give away my best ones. So that the Torah says, no, that's not the way of doing it. What you have to do, you have to let the Animals go in a very narrow lane, a narrow path, and you count them in a place where they can go out only one at a time. You count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the tenth, you mark it, and you say, This is the one that is going to be as a sacrifice, as a holy gift to Hashem. And the Torah says that if someone tries to play games and is going to switch and is going to say, This is going to go instead of that. The Torah says, don't switch over here. If you switch or if you exchange, if you substitute animals, both of them have to go to the, to the holy temple. So anyway, that's, that's the laws of the tithing of the, of the animals. Okay. So the Pasha begins with instructions of the animal sacrifices. Oh, no, this is, so this is what we finished over here. Now we're going back to the, the beginning of the book. The beginning of the book is also the same thing. The beginning of the book of Ayikra also talks about the animal sacrifices. Okay. What do we read in the beginning of the Vayikra? That says, Vayikra Moshe, God called to Moshe and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting. And he said, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when a person among you brings a sacrifice to God, you should bring as your sacrifice an animal from either the cattle or the flack and so on. Okay. So. On the surface, what do we what do we have over here? What is the connection? Obvious connection is in the beginning of the parsha, in the beginning of the book, you talk about sacrifice, and the end talks about sacrifices. However, this is only a superficial association, and with this, we don't really see any takeaway message that we can take from this. There must be something deeper. So what deeper message is contained in the fact that the books, the bookends of Vayikra are about sacrifices, the beginning and the ends? Because it, it seems like it seems like this is the theme, as we said before, the note seifam bitchilasam bitchilasam, the seif in the beginning is connected uh, with the end and the end with the beginning. So therefore, it must be something about the sacrifices that there is a message right there. So to answer this, we must drill a, deep, a, a bit deeper, a little deeper in, in, into this. So the Hebrew word of sacrifice, the Hebrew word of sacrifice is korban. Korban also means getting close. 
Adam ki yakriv mikem korban, a person that among you that want to bring an offering, korban means an offering, but the meaning of this also is a person that wants to get close. And here there is a fascinating explanation from the Alter Rabbe about the meaning of this offering of a sacrifice. Says the Alter Rabbe, this is from the Lekut Eteira, says the Alter Rabbe, V'zehu adam ki akriv mikem. The verse states, when a person among you brings a sacrifice, Adam ki akriv mikem, a person among you, who is the person? Says the Alter Rebbe, person refers to the supernal one. The person refers to God himself. So we're saying a person among you wants to bring a sacrifice. He says that is referring to Hashem. And he brings the, the verse, a level of godliness. This then is the meaning. of it doesn't bring the translation here but in the hebrew you see kamosh katuv ve'aldmut akisei dmut kamari adam it is written that in the and the image the image of the throne there is an image like an image like an, uh, of a man it refers to a certain level of godliness it says, this then is the meaning of when a person among you brings a sacrifice. It refers to a time when a divine inspiration of a supernal one descends to bring the heart of earthy man closer to God. That's what it says. Am shoch de leila, a bringing closer an arousal from above, from the level of divine men, Adam Elion, to bring close the heart of man down below. That is the first part. Later, the verse says, Mina Behima, from the animal, you should bring your sacrifice. This refers to the earthly person bringing himself close to God from his own end. Okay, what is the Alter Rebbe saying here? The Alter Rebbe here identifies two dynamics that is a play in the process of the connection, the closeness between man and God. What are the two dynamics? There is a top down model and a bottom up model. First, there is a top down model. What does it mean? That God is making the move and is drawing us closer to him. You know, this, can, this is something that can be familiar to us. A person can have, all of a sudden, out of the blue, an inspiration, a spiritual, he becomes spiritually inspired. He wants to do something good, something positive. It's not that he worked for it, not that he meditated on God for a long time, thinking about the greatness of God, no. Out of the blue, he has all of a sudden, he wants to do something good. He woke up in the morning and he just wants to do something good. So this is God drawing closer to us. He's drawing us closer to him. It's something that is initiated by God. But then there is a second model. The second model in the God-human relationship is when we make the initiative, when we seek to draw ourselves close to Hashem. How do we do it? 
obviously that is something that is not as easy to do and it's perhaps not as common. But this is something that we do when a person works, meditates, he thinks, and he grows closer to Hashem by himself, by himself recognizing and allowing that greatness, that thoughts to penetrate, to meditate about those things, and allowing himself to change because of the thoughts that he has. This is what Alter Rebbe says, these two models, Korban sacrifice, cor- drawing close to God, you have the top-down model of God drawing us close to him from above by providing us with inspiration. And then you have the bottom-up the bottom up model. Thank you. The bottom-up model, when we make the initiative, working hard to focus our mind on, on spirituality and God. Now, the Rebbe, the Rebbe comes now and teaches us that the same two models, we, the Rebbe identifies this dynamic in also in the concluding verses of Vayikra that we learned before. Says the Rebbe, Seen inside. Says the Rebbe, Bechoi, Yeriz Kodesh Me'atzmai. What we, you remember the two, the two mitzvahs we read about the animals? We have the, the mitzvah of the Bechor, the firstborn, and the mitzvah of the animal, that is the Maisa Behema. This is the tithing of the animals. So it says the firstborn animal, is automatically holy, made so by designation from above. Its sanctity is independent of any human activity. An animal is born, it's born holy. The firstborn is automatically holy. By contrast, the sanctity of the tenth animal is dependent on human activity. A person needs to count the animals, and the tenth one will be holy. This is the difference, says the Rebbe. And here you see the two, the two corresponding things, just like in the that the Alter Rebbe says in the beginning of Vayikra, the Alter Rebbe says these two dynamics. The Rebbe identifies the same two dynamics in the last, in the ending of the of the Chumash Vayikra. These two dynamics of something that comes from above and something that comes from the person. Now, if we have to think about which one is better, or of these two models, which one do you think is better, a better model? Well, it would seem that being born holy. If you compare the, 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 first, the firstborn animal and the animal that becomes the tithing, which one is considered in a higher level, you would think that one, something that is born holy sure beats being randomly selected to become a, a divine offering. But it turns out that this is not the case. How do we know? Well, the Talmud tells us there's the following rule. It says in the Talmud, Hakol If you want to know what is considered holier, look, what is the end? What do we conclude with? This is a quote from the Talmud. Okay. So here, the, this is the question. Firstborn animal. Its holiness is imposed on it by divine fiat. And the tenth animal is its holiness is generated as a result of human endeavor. So which one is holier? Which model is better? 
says the Talmud, Akal Oilech Acharachitum, everything is determined by the end. Now, what is the end? We just read. What was the end of the book of Ayikra? He's talking about the laws of the tenth animal. The question is, shouldn't the holiness of the firstborn animal be superior? Its sanctity seems much greater as it is imposed directly by God. Here you have the firstborn animal is something that a holiness that receives from Hashem. First, God decided that this animal would be born first, and therefore he has its holiness. And the tenth versus the tithing, the tenth animal, is something that you, we decide ourselves. We decide ourselves to make this tenth. Or even worse, it's, it's randomly. We take it out and randomly that person, that animal became the tenth. So, nevertheless, Al-Tarab explains that although one may think that the other one, the other side, that the animal, that the side that comes from Hashem is greater, al explains that that is not the case. That yes, of course, when it comes, anything that comes from above, from God, has a greater power, has a greater holiness. But there is an advantage in something that comes from below. Something that comes from above, al explains, it is a divine inspiration Indeed, it is awesome. It is meaningful. However, it's not transformative. It doesn't, something that comes from above doesn't change who we are. When you have an inspiration from above, just like in the inspiration we spoke about earlier, all of a sudden you're inspired. All of a sudden you get something that inspires you and you don't know where it's coming from. It may be a great inspiration and may lead you to do amazing things, but the, the question is, does it transform you? Did you become a, a different person? No. It is something that lasts momentarily while you have this inspiration, but as soon as this inspiration is gone, you go back to your old self. What do you do with it? Let's see what the Alter Rebbe says. Sanctity that uh, confers from above may appear stronger and better, yet it lacks one fundamental element, lasting power. Says the Alter Rebbe. We find two levels of divine service. One level is inspiration from, above, from below, when a person exerts himself physically and mentally and concentrates deeply with a humble heart, this causes him to merit the light of divine closeness. In this model, there is an inspiration from below, which then generates an inspiration from above. The second level is when a person suddenly feels inspired without any prepar preparatory to work or effort. We see this often when people suddenly become inspired and experience intellectual and emotional excitement in the prayer for a period of time, of time without knowing where these feelings came from. But this inspiration is short-lived because it is an inspiration from above designed to generate an inspiration from below on our end. The difference between these two levels is that when we have a genuine inspiration from below, as the result of hard work, it is enduring. 
this generates an inspiration from above, which shines in the depth of our soul because we prepared ourselves for it properly beforehand. This in turn gives us the ability to continue the cycle with further inspiration from below. So this thing really is true in both ways. It is true when a person has inspiration, when you work hard. You work hard, you meditate, you think. This is why one of the main things in Hasidus, as it says in a Yom Yom today also, it says the beginning of the downfall of a person is the lack of focusing, inspiring when doing the prayer. That when you do, when you do the prayer properly, you focus, you meditate, you, you, you don't do it you know, mechanically. If you start doing things mechanically, all of a sudden you start losing interest, you start losing excitement. And, you know, and before you know it, you, you do everything mechanically, everything rush and everything. So, so here, and, and, and the Rebbe says, now, yum, yum, if you want to inspire other people, you better be inspired yourself. How could you inspire other people if you're yourself now doing things mechanically? So you got to focus, got to think. And that's why we study before the Avani Hasidus to get inspired. So this is one way of working hard, getting inspired. And when you get inspired, as a result, you have something from above that comes to you. Something will come to you if you work hard. But on the other end, if a person one day wakes up and he's all inspired, all excited, and he will do, he will act amazingly this that day. But what's going to be next day? He's going to lose. It. What do you do? So when the inspiration comes from above, what you need to do is grab the opportunity, realize. That right now, it is opportunity for me to start working. And this is when you get this inspiration from above and you start working and you start focusing and you start learning, then it will help that this inspiration from above will become something that is lasting. Okay. Now, let's go a step further. Until now, we explained what is the advantage of man-made inspiration versus God inspiration from above is that the endurance. That something endures more when it comes from, from, from you. The Rebbe is going to explain. It is not only the fact that it's all more enduring, that is lasting. Because when he said that is, it's that the only advantage is that it, this lasts more than really what is greater. What is really greater? The greater inspiration is something that comes from above. Except that when you do it on your own, that will last more. The Rebbe explains that there's more, it's deeper than that. The Rebbe explains that really the inspiration that comes from the person from bottom up is inherently superior to the other inspiration. What does that mean? So to explain this, we'll go back to what we said before. At the end of the beginning. When we connect the end of the beginning, we said the end of the beginning of the book, where is also the end of the beginning of the Parsha. The last Parsha, the Parsha is Bechul Kosei. In the beginning of the Parsha, the Torah talks about that if we follow Bechul Kosei to Leichu, Shmeiru, if you follow my laws, if you listen to my commandments, Hashem says, I will give you 
your the rain and time, the fruits and everything. Let's see it inside. In if you follow my statutes and observe my commandments and perform them, says the Torah, I will give you rains in the time, the land will yield its produce, and the trees of the field will give forth its fruits. Your threshing will last until the vintage, and the vintage will last until the sowing. You will eat your food to uh, satiety, and you will live securely in your land. Okay. Now this promise of reward for the mitzvahs can seem very strange. Why? Because when we do a mitzvah, what is it that we're saying? We commend, we do the mitzvah, uh, we decide to connect to Hashem, to do the right thing. And we decide that what is more important for us, our connection, our spiritual connection. Why would the mitzvah reward be a material reward? The rewards for being more spiritual, we says, okay, you get more materialism. Is that what the mitzvah is about? I mean, at least if there would be some mention of a spiritual word, the Torah says no. In Bechokai Satalechu, if you follow the mitzvah, give you all the material things. Is that what it's all about? A similar question can be also said in the, on the cosmic level. When we're talking about the Messianic age, we just finished, con concluded the Rambam. And the Rambam tells us in the end that in the time of Mashiach, there will be no lack of material, material needs. There will be no hunger. The pleasures will be found like, like dust. And again, the question is, is this what it's all about? Why should the ultimate reward at the end of days be one of physical plenty and not some sort of spiritual utopia? You would think this is what, what Mashiach is about. And the answer is, the way the Rebbe explains, that God indeed, he cherishes this world. Explained this many times. The idea that God wants a home in this physical world. And because the work is done in this physical world, and when in, in a place and time and, 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 and the circumstances that, that God, godliness is not revealed, we go and we fight and we bring the godliness in this world. This is why the reward is also in this world. That is an expression of God's ultimate purpose. He wants that this should be as a result of our spiritual work in this physical world. So it's not because that is important. What is important is the godliness that is revealed in the physical world. Let's see what the Rebbe says inside. Says the Rebbe, it is specifically the actions of physical human beings that manifest God's deepest desire. God desires to have a home in the lower realm. This is the reason why the reward from the divine service of making this world a home for God is given in the physical realm because the reward must be given in the place of the work.
So this is what it's all about. That showing that the material world is ultimately spiritual. We have to realize that ultimately what this material world is a spiritual world, except we don't see it and we reveal this. This is why the reward for the spiritual work is achieved in this physical world. It shows that the material world is ultimately a spiritual, a worthy home for God. And the same thing applies also, the same logic exists in our personal religious service. So when inspiration comes from above, when we inspire it from above, then it's not us. It is not, it is Hashem that inspires us. But when we work on ourselves and we inspire ourselves, and we get to this ourselves, this is the ultimate purpose of, of, of the creation of the world. And this is the ultimate purpose of us serving the way we serve Hashem. Now, this gives us this understanding, gives us an answer to the question that we begin with. We began with the question that is, when we don't feel inspired, when we feel in, in, in a way completely uninspired to do anything spiritual. What do we do then? So we give two options. Some people conclude that, okay, I'm not inspired. I don't want to do things fake. So I, I might as well not do anything. And other people will say, no, I got to do it anyway. I have an obligation. I got to do it. But here, based on this explanation, what the Rebbe says, there's a third way. There's a third way of navigating this dilemma. When we realize when, when you get to a moment, a human moment, a moment of totally being uninspired, then you have to realize, wait a second, this is my opportunity. If I'm uninspired, and I'm getting there now to do it myself, to work on it myself, to invest my own things and to create that inspiration within me. That's the ultimate reason why Hashem put me here. So therefore, we're not afraid of this. This doesn't throw us off when a person, when we wake up in the morning and I say all of a sudden, oh, I don't feel like it. And say, yes, that's my opportunity. Now I can go ahead and do it. You know, it's interesting. The, there was a study. What is the holiday that Jewish people do most? And that was the holiday of Passover. Not surprisingly. What is the holiday that Jewish people do least? That, may, that the least amount of Jews that, that uh, practice the holiday? is the holiday that is coming up now in two weeks, the holiday of Shavuot. Holiday of Shavuot, of the giving of the Torah. What is interesting is, is it, it explained in Hasidus. The holiday of Pesach was what? The holiday of Pesach was something that comes from above. God took us out of Egypt. He elevated us, and he brought us closer to him. He elevated us instantly from the depth of, of the darkness of Egypt. That's the holiday of Pesach. We celebrate the freedom. God freed us. What is the holiday of Shavuot? Is receiving the Torah. Receiving the Torah, the Jewish people worked on it. As we are now in the days of the Omer, counting the Omer, step after step. The Omer is 49 days. These 49 days, they represent, each day represent a different emotional character that we change. And this emotional character that we change is something that we, we, do, with, we do it with going into details. It is our own doing. So this doing that on our own leads us 
to Shavuot, to receiving the Torah. And that's something that we do on our own. No, no, so not surprisingly, it's not so practice, not so common. But yet, as the Rebbe says, that now we live in the time of Mashiach. And the Rebbe encouraged that we should encourage everyone, children, to come to hear the Ten Commandments and the holiday of Shavuot, which comes up in two weeks. And realizing that whatever we do, it is an opportunity. Even in the darkest time, it is an opportunity. And we shouldn't let this drag us down. On the contrary, when we see something dark, we know that this is a time that we are able to reach very deep in ourselves and connect to a much stronger way to Hashem. So thank you so much for joining. Um, we can take anyone comments or questions. Thank you very much, Rabbi Cohen. You're very welcome, Lazer.